use. Uh, I hope my screen is visible, sir. Yeah. A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to one and all present here. I welcome you all to the fifth lecture of our COE lecture series on molecular materials and functions. Today's speaker is Professor uh, Pulikal M. Ajayan, uh, a renowned scientist in the field of nanotechnology and 2D materials. Professor Ajayan uh, did his B.Tech in 1985 in metallurgical engineering from Banaras Hindu University, India. And he did his PhD in uh, 1989 in material science and engineering, Northwestern University, Evanston, Illinois, USA. Uh, from 1990 to 1993, he conducted his postdoctoral research uh, uh, in Fundamental Research Laboratory, NEC Corporation, Tsukuba, Japan. From 1995 to 1996, he was uh, Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellow at Max Planck Institute for Metal Forschung, uh, Forschung Stuttgart, Germany. I hope I, I pronounced it uh, correctly. And then uh, he, he, uh, uh, he served in Rensselaer uh, Polytechnic Institute uh, in Material Science and Engineering Department, Troy, New York, as Assistant Professor from 1997 to 1999. Associate Professor, then as a Professor and Director at uh, RPI Interconnect Focus Center, New York, and uh, Burleigh Chair Professor in Engineering from 2004 to 2007. Uh, he is a Distinguished Visiting Professor uh, here at IIT Madras, uh, Chennai, uh, and also Distinguished Visiting Professor at uh, uh, Shinshu University, Japan. Uh, he is now serving at uh, Rice University in Material Science and Nano Engineering Department, Houston, Texas. Uh, as Benjamin Yum and Mary Greenwood Anderson Professor of Engineering. His research interests include 2D materials, energy storage and catalysis, nanotechnology, optical and electrical devices, and 3D printing of nanomaterials. Uh, uh, he has over 1,300 plus publications with 1,81,000 plus citations and a H-index of 202. Uh, among many awards he has uh, uh, received, uh, some of them are Alexander von Humboldt Research Fellowship in 1995, Burton Award Microscopy Society from Microscopy Society of America 1997, National Science Foundation Career Award in 1998. Uh, he, uh, he has also uh, been uh, he has also been in Guinness Book of World Records for the darkest material in the world uh, as a co-inventor in 2008 and uh, smallest brush in the world uh, as a co-inventor in 2006. Uh, he's, uh, he was elected as MRS Fellow in uh, 2016. He has also received Lifetime Achievement Nanotechnology Award from Houston Technology Center in 2016. Jawaharlal Nehru Birth Centenary Medal for International Collaboration and Public Understanding of Science and Technology in 2019. And Alumnus of Century in uh, Making uh, Award IIT BHU in 2019. Uh, today's uh, lecture is titled as uh, Promises in Nanotechnology, Some Thoughts. So we are all very excited to listen to your lecture, sir. Uh, over to you now. I'll stop sharing. Okay, let me try to share. Mm, give me a minute. Are you able to see my screen? Not yet. Not yet. What about now? It has yes, come now. Make it full screen, please. Okay. Hey, thank you, Amoga. That was a long introduction. <laughs> uh, I think the really wonderful thing is that uh, uh, there are several people who I know very well <laughs> on this audience, and uh, great to and some of them I haven't seen for a long time. So uh, great to be here. <clears throat> um, I'm actually, you know, I, I'm sorry I haven't attended many of these lectures, partly because of the travel. It's been my sabbatical year, and uh, right now I'm in London. So time-wise, it's pretty good, but uh, sorry, I haven't been able to be part of this series. <clears throat> I'm, I'm sure you're enjoying uh, with several talks I can see coming from really well-known people. 
Uh, I thought that, uh, you know, I'll, I'll talk about something slightly different from a real deep uh, dive uh, technical talk. Uh, and part of the reason is, uh, you know, people like me or several others in the audience have really made a career out of nanotechnology. And uh, sometimes it's good to kind of uh, look back and see, uh, you know, what we were thinking at the time when some of these things were done and uh, how things have evolved with time. Uh, I think that this particular area has still, uh, you know, very, very active. Uh, so many people in, uh, working in this field, uh, industries adopting some of these technologies. Uh, it has diversified significantly. Uh, so a lot of things have happened and, uh, uh, and, and you know, the, the perspective is, it keeps changing with time. Uh, I also want to kind of distinguish uh, what I'm going to say today from the, the traditional semiconductor technologies, which is mostly top down. Uh, and that, uh, you know, if you, if you really think about where nanotechnology has had huge impact, it is those technologies which has been done through the top down approaches of microfabrication or nanofabrication. Uh, it's significantly, uh, I mean, it's, to me, it's amazing that, uh, you know, 1970, people were looking at 10 micron uh, node uh, that has come to, you know, five and even three in the future. So uh, the industry is able to really work at that scale uh, and get devices that perform reasonably well, uh, which, uh, you know, we never thought 10 years ago uh, that this is going to happen. Uh, but but uh, you know the, the the traditional nano materials and nanotechnology that we talk about uh, is related to this bottom up approach of uh, building uh, you know discrete nano objects and understanding the properties and integrating them into devices and so on. So there is a there is a disconnect or there is a difference between this uh, mainstream top down technologies that have done very well and the bottom up uh, uh, approaches that we dream about. <clears throat> Uh, and a good example would be uh, something like uh, molecular electronics, where uh, you can really reach the ultimate uh, dimensional scale uh, of any possible devices. And uh, the question is how uh, well these technologies can be integrated into competing <coughs> or even mainstream uh, industry. Uh, as as uh, Moga said, I come from RISE, which is kind of uh, uh, well known in materials and nanotechnology. Uh, I'll mention later that uh, the discovery of fullerenes kind of initiated this whole area in, in a significant way. Uh, and it's about a hundred year old university, uh, which has about 6,000 students. <clears throat> That's kind of a broad uh, summary of Rice University. Um, <clears throat> so what is happening today is this transition from nanomaterials to quantum materials. In, uh, in some sense, it's one and the same, maybe packaged differently. Uh, but, uh, you know, if somebody, if people are asked what a quantum material is, you probably will get very different answers. But I suppose it's more about gaining control all the way to the single atom scale or single defect scale. Uh, but uh, in many ways, there are similarities uh, between what we uh, broadly call nanotechnology and quantum uh, technologies and quantum materials. So recently we have been uh, involved in editing a special issue for advanced materials, and that's going to come out uh, sometime soon, uh, uh, focusing on various aspects of quantum materials, uh, particularly from a materials point of view. <clears throat> uh, and um, uh, this is an article, that, what the image that you're seeing here is an article that was written by a few folks from my lab and uh, some collaborators. Uh, and it, it's interesting uh, to kind of break down what the major challenges are in, in this field. Uh, and again, I'm going to just uh, very briefly mention about the things that they talked about. Uh, there might be others, and again, uh, depending on who you talk to, you can get various perspectives. Uh, one of the things is about compatibility. And, uh, and compatibility means, uh, you know, hetero structures, integration. Uh, even if you have uh, a beautiful nanostructure like a carbon nanotube, the uh, real challenge becomes when you start to integrate this with contacts and other uh, parts of the platform that you're trying to build. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, because of the dimensions, uh, you know, there are significant issues like uh, signal to noise ratios and uh, things like that. 
So uh, I think that that has been one of the overriding challenges, which I will mention time and again in my talk. So, uh, you know, how do you really build uh, a platform with uh, multiple material systems, uh, different dimensions, and how do you really uh, create a, a seamless architecture? <clears throat> so that, that's always been an issue. Uh, the other that is really uh, directly related to some of the things that we uh, do uh, is, is characterization or correlational. Essentially, uh, are there techniques uh, that you can use to quickly characterize nanostructures so that uh, you, you understand uh, what these materials are, what the defect densities are, how, how good they are? I think many times what you see in literature is kind of dispersion of data partly coming from this lack of understanding of the actual structure that you're looking at. Uh, so structure property relationship uh, in, a, in a, uh, you know, either in-situ uh, techniques or you know, quick uh, characterization methods is kind of lacking uh, in this field in my mind. <clears throat> and computational uh, is very interesting because that has really blossomed in the last many years. Uh, yeah, I think this whole idea of materials genome and uh, similar uh, machine learning based approaches has allowed us to uh, focus in on certain things and uh, make experimental <coughs> roles comparatively uh, less difficult. Uh, but of course, you know, uh, synthesis and processing is what I'm mostly going to talk about uh, because that's what our expertise is. Uh, and uh, I think this is a significant problem in many ways uh, because, you know, still we lack uh, consistency and uh, lack of quality and understanding of that quality uh, in addition to scalability. Whether you're talking about carbon nanotubes or graphene or other 2D materials, uh, th this is a, a fundamental problem that has plagued uh, this field uh, in, in, a, in a big way and perhaps kind of uh, resisted uh, rapid expansion uh, of these materials into uh, of course, nanotechnology is a very broad topic, uh, spanning from nanomedicine to uh, structural materials. Uh, so it's certainly not possible to cover everything. So I, I picked a few examples, and depending on the time, uh, you know, I can finish uh, at the end of the hour. <clears throat> uh, but uh, I want to start talking about the carbon materials, which um, uh, some 2D materials and uh, maybe a little bit about nano. So let's uh, start with the carbon nanomaterial systems. Uh, and uh, as I said, you know, rice has been the central point for the discovery of uh, these nano structures of carbon. And uh, you know, this beautiful molecular structure of the 360 <coughs> was discovered serendipitously. And uh, um, yeah. sorry if you want to go into that. Uh, kind of uh, described that in a, in the short a couple of years ago, uh, but uh, you know that this has expanded into other uh, nanostructures of carbons like carbon nanotubes and graphene. And for almost two and a half decades now, uh, these materials have been uh, almost the fo uh, poster child uh, for uh, nanotechnology. Uh, essentially demonstrating every possible beautiful uh, physics and chemistry in these systems. Uh, so, uh, you know, in itself, these structures, um, in addition to being applicable in certain areas, have also uh, served as some kind of standards or some kind of uh, uh, example for how nanotechnology is going to be uh, impacting many things. <clears throat> so, uh, let me again mention that, uh, uh, you know, we started working in this in the 90s after the discovery of nanotubes at NEC. Uh, and over the years, we dealt with many things related to the synthesis, processing, and uh, assembly of these nanostructures. And I'm just going to, you know, in a few quick examples, uh, show or, or kind of demonstrate uh, some of the challenges that face uh, these assembly processing. Um, here are some images that show you know, uh, the growth of nanotubes onto either predefined uh, uh, or essentially networks uh, of structures in the substrate. Um, and, and you can see that the self-assembly doesn't really uh, create perfect architectures. I think this is one of the fundamental issues that we had 
when we are trying to build a large periodic network of these nanotubes. And if you go to three-dimensional structures, it, this is even uh, more complicated and almost impossible in some sense. <clears throat> uh, I mean, if you think about the, the microelectronics platform, these are complex 3D architectures, uh, which uh, uh, you cannot really replicate using self-assembly or uh, the chemistry techniques that we use. And then there are also significant issues because these are Van der Waals materials uh, creating uh, interfaces and junctions between You have to really break bonds and reform them, which is uh, and it changes the behavior locally as well, electronically as well. So th there are some uh, significant challenges related to uh, building uh, junctions. And the hetero structure formation is also uh, Build these structures, but uh, you know, to consistently uh, to understand how these interfaces are uh, in terms of electric mechanical behavior uh, is also complex. And and then the entire nanotechnology field, especially as you go to bulk systems, uh, interface engineering problem: how you can understand the interface engineering. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, the, the biological systems that are also built up from bottom up. Uh, the, the interface really rules the entire structure in many cases. Uh, so the question really is, how do you control interfaces? How do you engineer interfaces to make it uh, work the way we want? There are also some intrinsic issues. Uh, you know, unless you are really uh, trying to make um, a molecular um, structure molecule like C6, uh, in, in general, the nanomaterial uh, synthesis approaches uh, give you this distribution of particle sizes and distribution of structure. So, uh, you know, uh, depending on the, the, the catalyst or the temperature or any other parameter that you take uh, in, in the growth chamber, you are going to get a, a simple distribution of uh, various diameters, various, uh, uh, you know, chiralities in the nanotube system, a number of layers. Uh, there isn't really anything we can control because most of these growth occurs at a very uh, nanoscale. And uh, you know the, the exact uh, conditions at that scale is hard to really control. So, what you end up with most of the time is, is a distribution of uh, uh, structures. And because there is a strong uh, correlation between chirality, dimension, uh, properties, uh, you essentially are, in, are going to end up with a, a, a diverse <coughs> array, uh, array of material systems. You know, it could be semiconducting, metallic. Uh, you never know what you get. So th this is again uh, one of the issues with uh, uh, manufacturing or synthesis at that scale. But that being said, uh, you know even from the very beginning there was no dearth for uh, real uh, brave statements like what Smalley used to say that we long nano fishing rod and we're fishing with it. Um, I think the, the the difficulty involved in doing something like that we have realized slowly uh, but uh, surely. Uh, it's taken a very long time <coughs> uh, to actually be able to spin these type of fibers in continuous routine. Uh, this is actually my colleague Sophia Atrice, who's able to, using wet techniques, uh, acid techniques, to spin uh, almost continuous pool of uh, nanotube fibers. Uh, Ajayan, uh, I'm losing your uh, sound. Uh, I don't know whether it is it is only me uh, or other. No, sir, it's uh, uh, everyone. Yeah. Everyone is losing. So, so you can't hear me at all, or no, no. Part of, part of the voice is getting lost. Yes, yes, it is breaking. Okay, let me bring it closer. Is that better? No, no, it is okay. But it is that uh, every let's say a few seconds we are we are losing you in, in a sentence. So it is the network connectivity. Yeah, it's possibly the network. Should I switch off my video? Yeah, maybe that. Um, let me stop the video. It might help, but uh, I don't know. Back. Is, is that better? Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'm in a rented place, so I wouldn't <laughs> know how to do. Um, so uh, what I was saying is that uh, you know it's taken a while to uh, be able to start with the individual nanotubes and spin these continuous fibers. Even uh, after doing that, uh, you, if you look at the properties of these fibers, uh, you know you still have challenges. 
because sorry, I'm not able to change my slide. Um, so um, I, I was talking about these carbon fibers that now one can do continuous spinning. Uh, and if you really compare the properties of some of these fibers with uh, you know, existing carbon fibers, you're still not in that uh, regime. And of course, uh, you, you, these are expensive and um, hard to find uh, this significant problem finding the right kind of nanotubes even now. Uh, but if you can look at uh, the data, this is a recent review paper from the materials group uh, showing that uh, you know there's been improvements uh, in, over the years, but still it falls short of uh, what would be what one would like to call uh, revolutionary or competing with metals in terms of conductivity and carbon fibers in terms of strength. <clears throat> uh, so uh, again, I think the reason for this is uh, quite obvious. It's because these short fibers, as they are uh, put together into a longer fiber, the interfaces dominate uh, the actual behavior. And once uh, time and again, you see this happening as you try to um, go from nanoscale to macro scale uh, and, uh, and in terms of scaling. Uh, in terms of conductivity, there was another area that was being pursued by industry and academics alike in the early uh, times of nanotubes, and some of you might be aware of it. And this was the idea that uh, these short fibers uh, would be very good interconnect. Uh, interconnect's a major problem in electronics as you go to smaller and smaller sizes. The metal wires become problematic due to electromigration and oxidation and things like that. So if you can actually create a metallic carbon nanotube, um, you know, via, that would really uh, be wonderful. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, there has been so many years of uh, hard work gone into this, but probably uh, ultimately abandoned, uh, partly because uh, of the fact that, uh, well, there were two problems. One of them was the lack of the density that uh, they were able to achieve by growing in these vias. And without uh, a tight, uh, highly uh, condensed uh, uh, fiber with nanotubes, you can re not really get uh, the conductivities of uh, copper or other metals uh, that are in competition. And the other problem was the, the contacts between the metals and the nanotube. So although nanotubes could be ideal uh, conductors, uh, you know, metallic nanotubes, and they could carry really high amounts of current, without falling apart, uh, without having any electromigration, uh, the, this uh, experiment really failed because of uh, extrinsic reasons. One, the inability to be able to create highly dense nanotube fibers and the inability to make good contact. <clears throat> now, uh, one thing uh, you, know, you might say that maybe these nanostructures have multifunctionality, which might so in a, you know, if you can combine uh, flexibility, mechanical strength, thermal conductivity, electrical conductivity, all of them together, then we might be able to compete with uh, metals in certain applications. Uh, and here is another application which a lot of people are pursuing, and this is related to uh, probes and probe cards. And uh, th these are essentially nanotube conductors grown on a substrate in a vertical orientation. And uh, uh, the fascinating thing about nanotube is that, uh, you know, they're, they're extremely, uh, uh, you know, the bending modulus is low in graphite, so it can be easily compressed and bent and so on. And so a lot of work was done during those days in terms of uh, uh, compressional, dynamic compression studies uh, to look at uh, how you can uh, create these uh, spring-like material that are highly conducting and more resistant to oxidation and so on. And uh, there were several papers, you know, including ones that show activity uh, solutions. Again, sort of copper, you are able to create these patterns that slap onto the back of the chip, thermal management, or uh, some kind of a brush contact that allows you continuously create contacts with moving uh, parts in contact and uh, uh, you know things like probe cards again again we are still uh, we are losing you i don't know whether uh, okay. there is our uh, having the same problem um, manfred are you hearing him i hear him uh, most of the time but he goes in and out um, maybe every in in 20% of the time 
Yeah, I, I don't yes. know. Actually, I, I'm staying still, <laughs> but uh, it must be the network. I, I'm sorry, guys. I mean, I'm staying. Yeah, it uh, must be. It must yeah. be. Well, uh, well, let us proceed. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, so I was talking about these uh, conducting, uh, you know, wires that uh, people have tried to integrate. <laughs> Uh, but uh, there has been some uh, technical challenges, engineering problems that uh, uh, I think there is still activity going on in this area, but uh, it has been challenging. Um, this is actually some work that uh, was done recently at RISE from Jun Corno's lab. Uh, we were part of that work, uh, essentially uh, trying to get to a point where you really get to highly ordered architectures using these nanomaterials like nanotubes. <clears throat> and um, uh, you know, this particular uh, simple approach uh, is essentially a standard vacuum filtration uh, from extremely well dispersed nanotube suspension that allows you to make uh, almost uh, 90 plus percent uh, alignment in certain direction. So, uh, you know, you're able to make a film of nanotubes, unlike the typical nanotube mats that you can buy, which are essentially a random network of nanotubes in the plane. Uh, here, these are almost entirely aligned in one direction. And once you're able to do that, and, and also pretty dense uh, material, uh, once you're able to do that, uh, you can really get some uh, amazing properties. For example, this particular film is opaque to light, polarized parallel to the alignment, and it's uh, uh, um, <clears throat> uh, transparent in the perpendicular direction. So once you're able to achieve this type of ordered uh, architectures, ordered structures from uh, nanomaterials, uh, which is really the goal of nanotechnology, that then you are starting to see some significant uh, impacting uh, problems. And uh, again, if somebody wants to you as well, uh, lots of uh, using these films, they've been able to demonstrate uh, a large There are also been uh, uh, lots of work in uh, academy industry collaborations. This is coming from IBM, uh, suggesting that uh, if you can actually make these type of uh, highly aligned nanotube arrays, you can make a really uh, thin film uh, TFTs or transistors uh, on, a, on a flexible substrate. And uh, you know, if you get these density of nanotubes right, the type of nanotubes right, like more in this case, then you could get uh, reasonably high current densities, pretty large current on-off ratios, and also even uh, sub-threshold uh, characteristics that are quite reasonable. <clears throat> so again, I, th I think the point I am trying to make is, uh, you know, uh, industry has certain needs and requirements, and many times working together with industry helps us to uh, go in the right direction uh, so that you can achieve some of those um, requirements, rather than, you know, from our own perspective, uh, uh, prophesizing that this is kind of uh, where we want to be, uh, because many times uh, the properties of individual nanostructures cannot be translated to the larger scale because of interfacial problems and other extrinsic uh, problems. Now, the, you know, again, I did briefly mention the fundamental problem with this three-dimensional uh, architecture or structuring nanomaterials, <clears throat> because self-assembly doesn't really give you that option, unless it is some kind of a template based on. So for example, I mean, can you ever really build something like this? Three-dimensional network of nanotubes that are properly connected uh, and creating all these nodes and, you know, the, that. Um, and, and we had pretty large programs trying to understand how these junctions work and how uh, one might be able to think about building some of these materials. Uh, there are some tricks you can use, for example, by utilizing certain catalysts, a specific catalysts like boron. Uh, one uh, can increase the number of uh, these branching uh, as the nanotubes grow. Uh, because I suppose boron, when it gets into properties that creates the topological defects and then you uh, forms these type of junctions. <clears throat> so uh, there are vapor phase techniques and uh, catalytic methods that allows you to make uh, almost three-dimensionally uh, interconnected nanotube structures, not periodic, but still uh, three-dimensional. 
and uh, you could you could essentially you know peel these kind of foam like materials off the substrate once you form them and such materials have been utilized for applications like energy storage and we still work on some of these materials uh, but of course that is not really reaching uh, the goal or the dream of what uh, uh, about you know how do you make periodic structures how do you make uh, well defined uh, uh, and, and a very similar story to graphene as well <clears throat> so showed those type of 3d structures of nanotubes just wanted to show graphene is also one of those building blocks where you can use these linking uh, processes vapor phase whether it is through uh, chemistry and cross-linking, uh, one is able to build uh, uh, these structures. And once you have these type of three-dimensional, reasonably dense material, uh, they show remarkable uh, like thermoelasticity. You know, some of these things are uh, elastic, very high temperatures and very, very low temperatures, even to cryogenic temperatures. So if you have the right building block, like graph have the right architecture with the right amount of velocity, you could really build uh, some wonderful, amazing uh, structures that has uh, properties that range for a very, very large window of temperature. <laughs> and uh, of course, you know, th these are elastic, so uh, one could think of these as spacers or membranes and uh, very uh, fascinating materials. And from a theory point of view, also there's been lots of predictions that if you can build carbon in certain uh, nanoscale architecture geometries, uh, like seeing here, you can have specific properties. I mean, people have predicted even magnetism and so these kind of materials, purely carbon. Uh, and uh, again, uh, you know, uh, when you think about carbon, essentially, especially. So and uh, how do you really um, control the fraction of sp3 and sp2 in many of the carbon materials so that you uh, introduce certain uh, specific behavior? Uh, but again, the problem from an experimental point of view is that how do you really get these periodic structures? I think essentially the only way in a bottom-up approach you can think of in building these architectures is through things like 3D printing. Of course, what you're seeing is not in scale. <laughs> This is polymer at a much larger scale uh, because today's 3D printing cannot achieve nanoscale resolution. Unless you go to some specific techniques like the uh, two photon polymerization, there people have been able to create uh, very, very small uh, features in 3D printed structures. Uh, so, this is an example <coughs> recently published on silica, again, using these. Uh, approach and printing, you can get very, very uh, small features. So the question really is, uh, can you print perhaps some carbon materials also uh, that uh, are in scale uh, so that you can actually start to see the behavior that's been predicted for nanoscale carbon? Now, chemistry uh, has to play a big role. I mean, uh, most of the audience are more of chemists. Uh, and um, uh, I think Again, you know, Pradeep's group and other groups have done a lot of work in, um, creating clusters that molecules. Uh, the question really is, you know, how controllably you can do this. Uh, in the case of metal clusters, I suppose you have quite a bit of control. But in chemistries like, uh, you know, carbon uh, chemistry, oxidation, things like that, there isn't much control. You, you oxidize and you end up with a bunch of functional groups on the carbon. Uh, and that's one way of actually going from uh, conducting carbon to non-conducting carbon, uh, essentially graphene oxide and things like that. And uh, utilizing some uh, scalable approach, you could think about engineering these into uh, various levels of uh, oxidative, oxidated and uh, non-oxidative. So you know, a good example here is shown as a supercapacitor device where you used a laser beam to essentially reduce locally to create devices gains can be scaled up. <clears throat> so by understanding the chemistry and uh, uh, using processes that are scalable, one can still create interesting structures that are useful, 
from uh, your building blocks, right, or nanotubes, of, you know, graphene or. And uh, again, I, I don't think we have really done the ultimate chemistries in system. Uh, this is a collaborative work with Pradeep, uh, one of my students when he visited, essentially suggesting that uh, if you have, if you are, if you know what kind of functionalities you can attach to uh, a nanomaterial, uh, can you interact and uh, create uh, local linkages and local reactions that could be controlled. And, um, uh, and, and the resultant of that would be that you might be able to consolidate materials much uh, easier at lower temperature. So uh, using those functionalized carbon nanomaterials, which can in close proximity react, we were able to uh, create graphitic structures with reasonably high density by simply room temperature compaction. So if one can do that, if we can take uh, carbon precursors or you know, yeah. carbon building blocks and simply room temperature compact to make, get graphite, that will be a, a great application. It's, uh, it's uh, energy saving in a significant way because graphitization is typically done at very high temperature. And of course, there, there are other uh, structures also you can make from these uh, uh, carbon-based materials, you know, carbon dots. And this is an area where significant work has been done in the past uh, decades. People can now not only size select some of these quantum dots that uh, uh, carbon, graffiti carbon, but you can also do this in a pretty high yield uh, this is a technique that we designed where you do a cryo milling technique or cryo processing technique where because of the mechanical uh, properties at lower temperatures you can break up these uh, uh, materials pretty well and get very high yield of uh, quantum dots and you know these quantum dots have been very very useful uh, in people have looked at the catalytic properties of these uh, not just pure carbon dots, but also nitrogen top uh, quantum dot. People have designed very specific sizes of these quantum dots that fluoresces in different wavelengths. So you can really get an entire spectrum of um, uh, colors uh, by utilizing these quantum dots. Uh, and of course, <clears throat> you know, given the uh, toxicity and all that of the traditional semiconductor quantum dots, the carbon dots might be uh, really something that uh, that's useful. So what I kind of mentioned in the first phase of this talk is uh, the trials and tribulations of dealing with materials like carbon nanotubes and the, uh, the challenges uh, that exist in uh, engineering them into products that are useful. And broadly speaking, the interfacial problem is so severe in some of these materials that uh, translating the properties of uh, nanotubes, a single graphene layer to uh, a larger scale <laughs> structure is really uh, a challenging problem. <clears throat> now, uh, most many of us who are working in carbon uh, and graphene and nanotubes kind of transitioned to 2D materials because there was a, a large range of material compositions that became available, uh, which looked like graphene, but has different properties like uh, band gap and so on. So many of us started to work on this and um, you know, realize as you try to synthesize these and integrate these into structures, you realize that the problems are somewhat similar to uh, what we were facing in the case of, especially the identification problem is <coughs> significant. Now, you know, 2D materials, as I said, is a really diversified portfolio with so many compositions, uh, materials that uh, range from insulating to semi and multiple ways of processing them. Uh, originally, most of these 2D materials were made from traditionally bulk layered systems. But today, one can really cleave materials along certain crystallographic orientations in any 3D material and get uh, uh, very interesting 2D structures. So even materials like iron oxide, which is not a, a layered system, one could extract uh, very, very thin layers of uh, uh, these materials <clears throat> by um, ultrasonication and separation. And many times, some of these materials, uh, depending on which orientation the surfaces are, <clears throat> can exhibit some really fascinating properties. So this is a, a thin uh, 2D material derived from 
magnetite uh, showing a very super low coefficient of friction because of certain terminations along certain crystallographic planes. So I think it's also possible on the van der Waals layered systems to design and build uh, very extremely thin 2D materials that has properties. And in terms of processing, most of us uh, work on uh, chemical work composition uh, and um, you know, we can create libraries of these today. Um, composition that you prefer. Uh, in addition to that, you can also convert some of the 3D structures to 2D materials. It's actually a nice synergy between the Maxine work and uh, 2D methods like saxagonite work, where by um, halogen uh, reaction, you know, by H2S or H2SE, uh, you can really create um, well-defined uh, and even doped uh, 2D materials like tungsten sulfide. <clears throat> In these particular reactions, uh, the compounds, among the compounds, some of them are high vapor pressure, so you can easily remove them, and you end up with these uh, beautiful layers of uh, TMD. But with all the activities, you know, ha that has been going on in this area, uh, one still, uh, what, what the real challenges and uh, where we could really, uh, whether we can solve some of them. Uh, in fact, uh, this is a quote from Andrea Ferrari, saying that uh, you know for graphene or 2d material cmos integration uh, you really need to come up with uh, processes that are compatible as reliable industry standards and that's uh, that's a big uh, big you know statement because <clears throat> many of the processing that we do have not really compatible with industry standards many of these materials are made at uh, 700 800 degrees celsius for example Many of them are actually grown on metals or you know, um, substrates that have absolutely no use in the semiconductor industry. So it has to be transferred. Uh, and, and more than any of those, I think the reproducibility of these materials are uh, sometimes questionable. <clears throat> so uh, th there are multiple steps before one can uh, clearly uh, go to the next uh, uh, TRL level where you're, you can think about integrating. And again, the other question is, you know, now there are libraries of these materials, large number of compositions that, and how do we benchmark some of these? And how do we really connect to what industry might need? Uh, of course, most of us work in academics and that's fine. I think there are wonderful things to do, uh, but, um, uh, you know, there has to be some <clears throat> justification on the kind of promises that we make. And uh, that, that's precisely what I'm really talking about. Uh, there has been wonderful demonstrations of devices. Uh, you know, I think we all know that beyond certain scale, the MOSFET technology has significant issues. Uh, so people have come up with uh, architectures, designs that allows 2D materials to be used. Uh, you know, about the gate uh, electrostatics, for example, uh, subthreshold spring problem. Uh, you know problems that silicon overcome. So uh, one certainly has an opportunity to use these materials in, um, in devices of the future. The question is, you know, uh, do we have the level of uh, consistency in these materials or, you know, uh, how, how do we understand what materials we are actually trying to transition? Uh, this is a, you know, a very good uh, slide from Jim Horn's group in Colombia essentially showing uh, that uh, the same material grown in two different techniques uh, gives you very different behavior. In fact, they painfully calculated the defect densities and you can see that one of them gives very sharp peaks uh, in the PL spectrum showing that they are, you know, defects and uh, one of them very broad peaks. So I think the problem is well uh, demonstrated here that the kind of materials we grow in our lab uh, varies from batch to batch, varies from lab to lab. <clears throat> so I think, you know, there has to be uh, consistent methodologies that allow us to kind of uh, characterize them quickly. And uh, I think I started saying this from the beginning uh, so that we can identify the right material for the right application. 
uh, especially, I mean, of course, for many applications, the defect densities may not matter, but if you're thinking about optics, electronics, I think these are important parameters that one has to address. <clears throat> so I, I think, uh, you know, uh, th this is a, a fundamental challenge in many nanomaterial systems. Uh, because of the dimensions, we normally use microscopy and other localized techniques, but those are uh, not really um, you know, appropriate for a fast uh, turnover. And uh, I think you know, one has to think about other kind of techniques with good resolution that you can pinpoint what she is leading to. Now, uh, I think one of the most creative thing that has come out of uh, the 2D material um, area is this particular possibility of stacking them together. And if you are able to isolate materials of different positions, 2D layers, then the possibility of stacking gives you lots of opportunities. You can really build uh, artificially stacked Van der Waals compound. That just really, uh, you know, from, from a distance, it looks pretty uh, fascinating and simple. Uh, but because many of these uh, structures exist in different phases, um, you know, metallic phase, semiconducting phase, uh, called 2H or 1T prime, and uh, also because there are there might be rotational disorder as you're starting to stack these materials, uh, to really get to what you are looking for uh, could pose lots of challenges. In fact, uh, one of the <coughs> Big areas that emerge from this is this more structure that you can create by simple rotation. Um, that, from a physics point of view, is fascinating, and maybe even device point of view, it's interesting. But from a material synthesis point of view, it's it's re really uh, a holy grail. First of all, if you want to really try something like this on over a reasonable scale, you need to have single crystal material. Secondly, uh, to really control the orientation between the different layers uh, is going to be quite tricky. Uh, I mean, this is some yield study, uh, low energy yield study we did suggesting that um, uh, when the, the two layers are at a lower angle, and then they are strongly coupled, but when they are higher angle, about 30 degrees or so, then it's almost independent in, in terms of properties. So if there is a correlation between the layers in terms of the angular uh, rotation, uh, then how do you really control them so that you get the right angle? In fact, you know, uh, this is some parts. Uh, because you need single crystal layers, but even more importantly, if you're trying to grow them by uh, techniques at a high temperature, then there is a strong correlation between lateral size and stacking. So if you are going to make single crystals at higher temperatures, then essentially it will resort to the thermodynamic stacking that graphite is a good example. You know, the higher crystallinity you get into graphite, uh, the more you get uh, the Bernal stacking, ABAB stacking. So uh, to be able to get very large lateral crystal size and at the same time, certain orientation between the layers might be very, very challenging. Uh, but but it's an interesting problem. You know, I think the problem with some of the 2D layers is that there is no real epitaxy per se. So you have to rely on, um, you know, the uh, rotational <coughs> um, disorder possibility. Uh, I don't know how much time I have left. We are at uh, seven nineteen, so another maybe about five minutes more. Okay, yeah. So maybe I, I will mention uh, one more. Uh, area that we are actually working on. And uh, this particularly relates to this phase diagram, the boron carbon nitrogen phase diagram. And you already seen some of the things on graphene and some of the things on boron nitride. Uh, this particular phase diagram is fascinating for many, many reasons. Uh, one, there are both hexagonal, uh, the Van der Waals uh, compounds and cubic structures in this particular uh, phase <coughs> uh, diagram. <clears throat> I mean, we all we all know about uh, diamond. Uh, you know, it's an analog of uh, 3D <clears throat> carbon, and we all uh, also know cubic boron nitride, which is also fascinating but elusive material. Uh, and then there are many compositions, you know, two component, three component systems that uh, uh, exist both in cubic and hexagonal forms. And uh, there is a lot of interest in boron nitride today. There's a lot of interest in graphene. 
uh, we are also actually working on things like diamond and then cubic boron nitride. Uh, and there is a whole area of diamond electronics emerging for the ultra wideband gap material and cubic boron nitride could be an integral part of that as well. <clears throat> so when you're trying to grow some of these materials, uh, the question is, you know, how do you, how does, how do these uh, uh, multi-component systems uh, evolve? So this was some experiment did many years ago in our group, uh, trying to see if you could grow a thin layer of BCN, boron nitrogen carbon system, because thermodynamically they're predicted to be stable phases. And what we saw instead uh, is that, of course, you form these nice hexagonal crystals with uh, you know, pretty good crystallinity of the layers, but there is a strong segregation that happens between the boron nitrogen and carbon-carbon bonds. So essentially what you end up with is this domain structure that has uh, uh, coherent interfaces between boron nitride and carbon. They are very uh, similar in lattice parameter. So uh, they can form these nice uh, lateral junctions that form into the carbon. So I think that this uh, whole question about uh, how do I create BCN uh, is really trying to find a window where uh, certain faces are stable. And again, there is not enough uh, knowledge available in understanding the phase diagrams of some of these materials. So it's, it's mostly trial and error. And uh, what happens when you try to grow the three components uh, together is that you form these um, uh, layers of um, nitride and carbon. And uh, we have figured out ways by multiple steps to be able to create certain size, certain dimension of these domains. So you can make really engineered boron nitrogen carbon systems uh, planes. And uh, you can really think about some devices that are all uh, strictly for CD. So you can actually create an antenna, uh, a bean patch inside a boron nitride layer, and so on and so forth. So this is a really fascinating uh, engineering problem. <clears throat> uh, now, the fundamental problem, again, boron nitride now, as I said, has been used by many people for packaging of. Uh, most of them are done by growing at high temperature and then peeling off layers and putting them on the device. Uh, and that, that's uh, uh, problematic, as I said, you know, only not mostly compatible. So uh, one of the things in general for 2D materials that we have been doing in our lab is to see if some of these things could be grown at low temperatures. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, and again, we have done this for Know, TMDs, uh, and, and this is some work uh, on the boron nitride films. And it seems that uh, by using a plasma, uh, hydrogen plasma, you can actually create uh, uh, boron nitride. Uh, they are not very crystalline, they're nanocrystalline at very low temperatures. And so that might be an option to have nice films that are uh, deposited for packaging purposes on some of the devices that have uh, been built for these materials. <clears throat> I think the same story as the BNC uh, also applies to some of the TMDs. And uh, these lateral heterostructures or heterojunctions are very interesting because they form these coherent interfaces that are almost. And again, the question is, as you grow them or synthesize them, how do you control whether you're going to get uh, uh, the segregated layers or uh, interfacial? And in certain cases, like tungsten sulfide, molybdenum sulfide, we figured out that uh, temperature plays a major role. At higher temperatures, you get these segregated layers, and at lower temperatures, you form these lateral junctions. <laughs> and uh, also, there's a fundamental question. You know, these are atomically sharp junctions, almost a surface crystal. How stable are these uh, the interfaces? You know, the diffusion could easily happen from one side to the other. And again, we have done quite a bit of work in this area. You know, it's clearly a question about phase boundaries and phase stability. And uh, again, that, that would be a topic of yet another talk, but uh, uh, you know, these structures are quite interesting because you can essentially engineer them in plane. And this is another system, molytelluride, uh, with not compositional difference, but phase difference. So you can also pattern some of these molytelluride 2D systems in plane, uh, by 
choosing whether you want to <coughs> have one peak prime or two edge. And as you can see, this is actually a very large area uh, periodic structure of uh, one peak prime and two edge uh, moments override. And there are some fascinating properties of these. This is some theory that has been done by Angel Rubin. Suggesting that uh, you know, if you can surround some of these trivial phases with topological phases, then you can get some very interesting uh, behavior. <clears throat> and uh, finally, we, we can also make alloys of these. You can introduce more components. You can make structures like this, where you have um, multiple components distributed uh, uniformly throughout the lattice, and uh, again. These are fascinating materials, not much is known. And uh, I think the question really is, you know, how stable they are. So if you take uh, a four component system and you heat it, uh, you can see that they separate in two, two D phases. Uh, so I think, you know, the, the, many of these materials in fact are used in applications. It's like uh, molybdenum sulfide is a good catalyst. In fact, if you, the industry, they use some additives like nickel into molybdenum sulfide. What we don't understand is that what nickel is actually doing. Right? Is it actually segregating locally, creating domains that are more catalytic? So I think playing around with these 2D systems gives us a good knowledge about how some of these structures are stabilized and so on. And finally, intercalation is a possibility when you have these layered systems. Particularly, what has not been discussed uh, is the possibility of having different layers of different compositions and then using intercalation as an additional uh, lever uh, to play around with the properties of these materials. So, I think there are lots of uh, materials aspects that one can talk about, uh, but uh, I'm going to skip all these and go in the last slide which, uh, uh, you know, many times in academics, what we do is uh, uh, creativity and we actually build lots of materials. We you know, characterize them to an extent that we can uh, and uh, uh, try to look at properties. But that's not really designing structures for end use or for kind of specific uh, properties that you can build. And that's where the difference is. I think, you know, maybe the, the message is that uh, uh, when we start to work with uh, people who are the end users or people who are stakeholders in being able to use some of these materials, uh, I think that the, the, the process is quite different. And maybe, you know, design is something that we should, or engineering of materials is uh, uh, something we need to pay more attention on. Now that's kind of the broad aspect of the message that I wanted to give. Um, questions and have a discussion. And again, this is more of a perspective rather than a deep dive into specific material system. Thank you. Thank you, Ajin, for that wonderful tour through the diverse problems that current nanotechnology is facing. I see that um, you are presenting a, well a view that material synthesis and precision control over that is something that we have accomplished, we have mastered. However, getting properties from single nanostructure is reproducibly engineering those structures reliably that is where challenges lie at the same time you also showed that several nanostructures many of the properties that we wish to have in terms of optical transmission fluorescence or some of these we can very well have mastery over these so essentially, it appears to me that one set of problem, one set of properties we can exploit significantly. Other set of properties 
we still have problems with. The set of properties we are in a position to exploit are those which are largely collective properties like transmission or fluorescence of these. Individual structures we have difficulties with. And those individual properties themselves will depend upon orientation of many other aspects. So how do we address those properties? What, what are the pointers to exploiting properties of individual nanostructures reliably, reproducibly? So I, I suppose it's an open question and, you know, I think anybody in the audience are, are more than welcome to pitch in. Uh, you know, I, I, I was talking about two different things. Uh, one, of course, as you said, the individual nanostructures have wonderful properties and I think we understand it quite a bit. And if there are applications that uh, access these individual properties like optical emission and things like that, um, you know, that, 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 that's, that's perfect. I think, you know, that, that's the application we should certainly look at. What I was really focused, trying to say is that as you transition from individual nanostructures and build up scale, uh, then you start seeing the issues. Uh, you know, whether it is uh, a nanotube fiber that you, that you spin or uh, a artificially stacked uh, Van der Waals structure, uh, that, those are not really controllable or they are more controlled by the interface that you create, right? So that, 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 that's, that's the issue that I think we need to worry about and think about. And uh, um, I, I don't have a solution per se. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's an evolving problem. I mean, maybe, you know, a, a strong theory or, you know, modeling aspect uh, to see how these randomness create uh, uh, you know, perturbations in behavior uh, could, could be a way to look at it. Uh, you, know, you know, it's like, um, uh, it's like you know, a good maybe analogy is sensing, right? In, in biological sense, uh, systems, sensing is not done by uh, high uh, specific um, selectivity, right? It, it, there's a bunch of an array of sensors that you, that you get some data and then you process it, right? Maybe given that we are now well into understanding all these uh, large data systems and so on, there has maybe there is a different approach to looking at device structures and so on. You know, even if you don't have you know very specific uh, performance or, or or variation in performance over a range of device structures, maybe you could pick up all that data and evaluate and figure out what the outcome is. Um, I mean, you know, again, this is just a line of thought, but um, to, to, I think in, in nanotechnology to be able to really key in on one structure or one dimension is quite a challenge from a materials point of view, right? I mean, you have been struggling with uh, this whole concept of cluster assembled materials, right? You can see it, it it's, it's, a, uh, you know, it's a damning problem really. Sure. Are there other uh, colleagues? Uh, Thomas, you have something. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for a very nice talk. It covered lots of aspects and uh, I'd say lots of fields. I would like to use your expertise uh, in carbon based materials to ask you if you, I'm not an expert in, I'm not working with graphene or graphene based materials. But what generally is the difference if you have a layer of graphene and you measure its conductivity, and if you compare it to the conductivity of a layer that is made by depositing these kind of flakes, these carbon-based or graphene-based like pieces, uh, right? if, you, if you simply deposit a very thin layer, in which bits of graphene are, lay are layered one on top of the other. And right. if you measure conductivity of that, I would of course assume that if it's a consistent layer uh, of graphene, it's uh, 
somehow well conductive, but can you distinguish if you have them sort of in mechanical contact overlayering, how conductive is a material that is made from smaller bits of graphene? I think uh, that's a, you know, I think it's a question that is very interesting. Even within a perfectly grown graphene layer, you see significant differences in conductivity. But if you are thinking about making a layer from pieces that are stuck together, conductivity should be pretty poor, right? I mean, it depends on the grain size and things like that, but it will be dominated by the inter, um, you know, the, the edge uh, resistance between the different layers that you are bringing together. And th then I have maybe a related question. Uh, how does it look with reactivity of these small pieces of graphene? Because you talked about graphene, quantum dots, and uh, whenever I've come across articles reporting on some sort of chemical modification of graphene, I had the feeling that the chemical modification is always like involves sort of disruption or changes of bonding yep. within that layer of graphene. So more or less this modification is turning graphene into a new kind of material, which I'm not yep. sure whether we can still regard as, as graphene. And yep. with, uh, so yeah, and, and most of the modifications seem to take place also by the edges, which are reactive and quantum dots, they, they usually sort of have lots of these edges. And so can you comment generally about yep. this uh, stability reactivity uh, of graphene as a, as a 2D material versus those smaller? Yeah. I mean, th there are been multiple approaches to make uh, these graphene flakes or quantum dots reactive. Uh, one of them, of course, is use the edges. And as you said, uh, if the edges are not really um, terminated with uh, specific things like hydrogen, um, it, it should be quite reactive because you, don't, you have a dangling bone right there. Uh, I think there is another aspect which we have been pursuing and many others as well, is to kind of uh, substitutionally uh, dope um, graphene by nitrogen, phosphorus, there are many elements that you can insert, which creates a different type of defects. So I think a lot of the work now you see in single atom catalysis and so on is related to this, you know, identifying or playing around with the environment of individual elements that you act and substitutionally insert into graphene. So it's a, it's a loaded question. I mean, there, there can be very many answers depending on, you know, what you really are doing to the graphene. But uh, broadly speaking, the reactivity certainly can be changed by chemistry. And as you said, if you do chemistry, you're changing the sp3, sp2 to sp3. So there's, uh, there's a change in bonding, change in behavior, the band gap. So you're not really talking about the same material for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for a lovely talk and for your answers. That's you. Yes, thank you very much for the stimulating talk. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah sure. Absolutely. Okay. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, it's very difficult to fabricate exactly the same nano devices. So this means that some of the devices will not work as we expect. So my question is, is there any error-proof strategy in fabricating nano devices? I don't think so. I mean, that, that's what I was coming to. And I, I think that's why I was... Uh -huh to say that maybe a different approach has to be taken, right? I mean, uh -huh. uh, I mean nanotube certainly has certain advantages. It's a stable, you know, it's, uh -huh. uh, it's you know, it's got good um, um, uh, sensitivity, but even if, you know, two nanotubes doesn't behave the same way, if you uh -huh. can do a machine learning approach or data approach to extract information from these things, that might be a good way to do it, right? Uh -huh. And I think you know that, that's the way most of the biological systems go. Right? You don't have the exact uh, structure in two different places, and uh, but this may be not the appropriate thing for several of our you know generic electronics platform that we that we used to. Right? Uh, but you know, again, coming back to your question, to be able to really key in on one structure, one chirality. 
and to have a pretty high yield for that is going to be a real challenge. And I think that that's the real holy grail here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Professor Rangara. Yeah, so uh, that's a great talk. Uh, uh, my uh, uh, question here is, uh, you are, all, of course, working on graphene-based materials. But then uh, when you look at uh, oxides and uh, uh, thin films of oxides, etc., uh, I thought this atomic layer deposition technique is quite successful in reproducing the films, etc. Et uh, I thought that is a more accurate method of uh, producing these nanostructures uh, in a reliable manner. I think many of these materials that we use, atomic layer deposition, uh, have not been successful, especially to get highly crystalline, defect-free uh, material. Uh, of course, oxides, uh, maybe most of the ALD gives you uh, disordered systems, right? I'm, I'm not very sure about oxides. Um, but um, uh, it, it again, you know, a couple of those techniques, if you can really modify to be able to do at, at the scale that we are working on. I mean, uh, even 3D printing, as I said, right? I mean, if you can get feature sizes that are in the nanoscale, then a lot, a lot of new things can be done. Uh, but ALD, I think people have tried. I mean, they, they do get uh, material deposition, but they get more nanocrystalline disordered kind of architectures. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the probably two, three more questions and close it after that. Uh, Wazim Nishan. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. Uh, it was really informative. Uh, so my uh, doubt is related to the graphene-based products currently being uh, used in the industry. So nowadays we can uh, see a lot of industries uh, started to use graphene-based products like, uh, if I would say, head for the tennis rackets. And uh, uh, even in India, if you would say log-9 materials coming up, their batteries and uh, good research going on in filtration sectors and all those. But could see most of the companies um, coming, uh, they, they are actually using graphene oxide and uh, base products. I, I, I'm interested to know uh, what would be the scope of uh, mechanical ex uh, mechanically exfoliated graphene in the industry. As we could see a lot of uh, high yield, high quality graphene, um, uh, mechanically exfoliated graphene processes coming up right now, developed in lab. So what, what, what do we think uh, uh, regarding the scope of mechanically exfoliated graphene uh, coming up uh, in the industry sectors? So uh, I suppose, uh, uh, you know, th there are two answers to this, right? One is related to bulk uh, applications and, uh, you know, for bulk applications, things like composites or uh, even you know, dispersions, membranes, uh, you, your quality may not matter that much. So what you're seeing in this image that I put up is you know, these uh, uh, shoes that people have been able to make with uh, graphene additions. Obviously, it gives you some additional toughness and flexibility. Uh, so there are value added propositions you know, for nanotubes, for graphene by introducing them into composite structures. Uh, but this mechanically exfoliated graphene that you mentioned, high quality, you know, starting with um, highly crystalline HOPG or things like that, uh, they are mostly used for electronic behavior or, or maybe uh, some specific uh, uh, optical devices and so on. So th those are not the bulk applications that you think about, at least from the, for your question, this is what I understand. Um, but, um, uh, you know, that, yes, you're right. I mean, there's been a lot of uh, exfoliated graphene materials, nanotube materials that is being used in industry, mostly in composite applications, and their quality is not a big issue. Uh, there, the issue is actually interface. So the way you exfoliate, the chemistry that you do, uh, those, those things matter when you finally get uh, uh, into the composite. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, Shubankar? You are muted. Am I audible to you, sir? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah sure. uh, first of all, it's my privilege to hear you, sir. Again, sir, because I started my research career by reading your paper, the epoxy nano composite with CNTs, and I mostly work with CNTs. Now, actually, I'm planning to work with mzin based epoxy nano composite. So, my basic question is: What would be the future of mzin based epoxy nano composite? Because already we are saying that mzin is much more capable than graphene, but still people are struggling with graphene. 
though there are people are not trying with mzine basically oh, i mean the maxines are a totally different set of material they are mostly metallic uh, and uh, you know for <clears throat> certain applications like increasing conductivity or electrostatic discharge applications probably maxine should be good enough uh, I, i think the advantage of graphene is mechanically they are probably you know quite good uh, they are reasonably cheap compared to most other 2d materials and and um, uh, you know it's carbon so density wise you have an advantage you know many of the composites i feel you know the the density is a big issue and that's a big advantage and carbons uh, being low density uh, you know allows you to get that uh, you know specific property advantage right so you know we, we talked about all the electrical conductivity and uh, strength and all that but if you look at specific properties specific conductivity specific strength uh, specific modulus then these nanotube materials or graphene materials really uh, hugely uh, are better right because most of the metals are heavy and uh, you know maxines are essentially metal based right and in terms of uh, you know sustainability carbon is considered to be a very good material so we all accept carbon in many ways all right uh, we have one more question yeah go ahead please are you 9755 huh <laughs> it's me arthur becha campus yeah. group also yeah, yeah. yeah. hi how are you <laughs> thank you for the excellent talk so i am entirely impressed <laughs> thank uh, you because of many many sides so my question is according to my physical intuition i i would <clears throat> expect that the van der waals materials uh the the uh, materials which has super low uh, friction because the corrugation is uh, low and uh, i would expect the lowest friction coefficient and you mentioned in this talk that the opposite is the case there are some non van der waals materials which exhibit this property what is yeah. the uh, explanation for the secret Well, I think we came up uh, on this particular material by chance. Uh, we we were exfoliating many of these uh, oxides, and we were looking at um, properties, including tribology. And this particular one, the magnetite uh, layer, again along certain directions, seemed to have um, almost you know extremely smooth surface. I, I don't think it's a generic property, but maybe if you have the right crystallographic orientation for the surface you might get uh, um pretty good friction properties i mean what you said you know it, it's an interesting um interesting thing to say about 2d materials right uh, you know many of these structures like molybdenum sulfide people consider it as very um uh, low friction but it's yeah. not always the case because there are many other Uh, parameters that uh, oh, yeah. in that are in friction i mean graphite is a good example right graphite is a poor uh, lubricant in a dry atmosphere or molybdenum sulfide gets oxidized very easily so they are not very good either so i think for friction properties what you need is a surf- surface that is very stable and uh, that is smooth uh, and electronic properties certainly matter i suppose uh, so i think this was kind of a, uh, you know by chance okay. thank you thank you all right um i see no other questions so um we will have to conclude we are already i think 20 minutes um uh, uh more into our scheduled time so let us uh, conclude this meeting uh, thank you professor ajayan for that wonderful talk and of course uh, i don't know who will solve these problems and there are too many open problems to be solved but then nanotechnology is yeah. making it different as well we are still pretty early into this field so i suppose there will be smart students who will come and solve this problem yeah but then biology the way that uh, biomimicry uh, could probably be a solution forward at least in a few of those issues yeah yeah thank you then thank you very much for listening and uh, uh, i think we are all from different parts of the world so good morning good night <laughs> thank you thank you then thank you. bye
Bye-bye.